So we started a new series. Uh, this is part four on God is. And we're talking about the attributes of God. Everything that God is in our life, everything that he is around us, everything that he is for our family, for our children, everything that he is in the bad times and everything that he is in the good times. And I'm on part four this week and I think there's probably still gonna be another four more parts. Amen, because I just can't get it all where I want it to be. But last week, who remembers what we talked about? Ever present. God is ever present. And what that means is that he is always with you. Every step of the way, everywhere you go, God is with you. He is with you when you're sad, he is there. He's with you when you're out in the club acting bad. Yes, believe it or not, God is with you and he's in you. He's beckoning you. Come on, people. Come on, church. You know this ain't right. Let's get on out of here. Let's get somewhere that's holy. Let's get somewhere that's separated. Separate yourself from the world. He's calling each and every one of us. He's with you when you're acting bad. He's with you when you're happy. He's with you when you're happy and you're smiling. He's with you when you got all kinds of joy in your life. He wants to experience that with you. He's with you when you're up and he's with you when you're down, amen? How many of y'all would say that God was with you this week? Yeah, amen, amen. Not everybody raised your hand, so we're gonna have a, a meeting afterwards so y'all can experience God. I'm gonna get some of my, my bouncers in here to put their hands on you, amen? Yes, in case you don't know, we do have bouncers. You just don't know who they are. So if any of y'all try to run up on me, get ready. You'll be surprised. Amen. Amen. Um, anyways, it's good to have fun in church, isn't it? But he's with you. God is here for you. His word says he will never leave you or forsake you. Amen. Alex, can you drop the, a little bit? I'm ringing in my ear, please. Just a little bit. Thank you. Uh, King David said in Psalms 37, 25, that he has never seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging for bread, amen? But I love how Hebrews puts it in chapter four, verse 14. It says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's so encouraging to me that we have a God who loves us. And look, the temptation isn't sin, guys. Don't make a mistake that just because you're being tempted, it's a sin. But if you look back for a second time, then it becomes sin. You look at Lot's wife, she looked back at the temptation of Gomorrah. And what she wanted was that lifestyle. She wanted to continue to live in that lifestyle and be a part of that. And they were instructed not to look back and because she did, she turned into a pillar of salt. Amen. Because of, the, of, of her desires to live that crazy life. But it, isn't it amazing that even in our weakness, when I'm so weak, when I can't even lift my head up off the toilet from being sick, uh, from being drunk or from, from overdosing on drugs that my God is there with me in my weakness. Even when I'm going through some marriage problems that God is with me. Even when I'm being tempted to look at things that I shouldn't be looking at, guess who's with me? My God, he's with me, he's beckoning me, he's calling me saying, come on, Timbo, you can do this. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And sometimes we gotta access that greater than he is part, right? Because we, we can look at our circumstances I think it's overwhelming. I look at the circumstances with my wife and I think it's overwhelming, but then I, I know the God I serve who is in me. And he's calling, he's saying, hey, greater am I that is in you. Sometimes we gotta access that greater part, church. We gotta, we gotta find it, we gotta reach in there and get it. Sometimes we gotta go through some things to get to it, but once you get to it and you get a, a, a realization that the God we serve is greater than the circumstances around us, you're gonna raise up with a hallelujah. Amen, you're gonna be shouting for joy because nothing can shake you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, amen? Amen, that's why it's so important. That's why it's so important to have a relationship with God. But it's also equally important that we know and have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Always people say that the Holy Spirit is the forgotten man of the Trinity. And what I've learned is a lot of people argue about the Trinity, and we're not going to get into the Trinity, but they always say that Trinity's not in the Bible, and I say, you're right, but neither is the word Bible, but we need them both, amen? So we need the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the part of the Trinity that we often forget about. We pray to God, we pray to Jesus, but we don't listen to the Spirit that's within us. Because remember, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit fell with tongues of fire, he fell and filled not just 12, we forget about the other part of the 120 men. They were filled with the Holy Spirit as well. The Holy Spirit is in us and it's for us and it wants to have a relationship with us, amen? And when we start talking about 
the Holy Spirit, people start freaking out. They say, oh, y'all are probably going to start talking in tongues. And my response to that is, I sure hope so. I sure hope so. I want people praying in tongues. I want people speaking in tongues. Because, not because that's proof that you're a Christian, but that's your prayer language to God that nobody can hear but him. So you oftentimes can't hear me praying, but I'm praying in tongues all morning. I pray in tongues all the way to work. I pray in tongues at my house. It's important that you have that relationship. But I just want you to know that if you don't pray in tongues, that doesn't mean you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Tongues is just one gift given by the Holy Spirit, given from the gifts that the Apostle Paul talks about. So if you don't pray in tongues, don't get worried. It'll come when it's supposed to come. You let the Holy Spirit work in you. Amen? Um, and yes, it's been abused. It's been abused. We've all got stories, and I'm going to share one with you. After our church flooded, I think early 2012, 2013 sometime, I believe it was, we were having church down here um, in the children's sanctuary, and we had this person come in, and she would run around the sanctuary just screaming at the top of her lungs, ah, da, 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 just blowing it out of the roof just screaming and waving her hands and people were freaking out and getting scared and like what is going on here and it bothered me I didn't understand it and when me and my wife first got married when our sanctuary was the other way we were sitting on the back row my wife was was raised Catholic born and raised her whole life never seen anything or experienced anything like this I was raised Jehovah's Witness and Mormon so we had a great conversation at dinner I can assure you not talking bad about them, by the way. I believe we all have a purpose. But anyways, that that's, was what was happening. And we're on the back row of the church, and this woman started screaming in tongues, and she fell on the floor, right? And she started kicking chairs, and she started flopping, and she started moving. Now look, li listen to me. When the Holy Spirit sets you free, you ain't going to have a choice but to let out a scream or a holler. I get it. I understand. But we didn't understand what she was doing. And so we left. We left the church because we didn't understand it. And I said all that to say, look, guys, some of y'all are new. Some of you don't understand about speaking in tongues. But if you see one of us letting out a hallelujah or letting out somebody praying in tongues, look, just stand with us because we're getting something out of us. It's got to come out. You can't keep it in you. And we left. We stayed gone for about, I don't know, better part of five years, and Charlie called us back. But anyways, I said all that to say, he literally did. I walked, he, uh, we decided one day we was going to come back. Um, I just got off a big turnaround, working seven days a week, and we, we had quit going to church because I was working so much. My wife was working weekends, and I just finally, I said, Emily, I just can't stand not going to church anymore. And so I, I come walking in the doors, and Charlie met me at the doors, and he said, Timmy, my boy, I've been praying for you to come back. And, you know, I gave him that little sideways look like, I know you have. Like, yeah, right, you know, you're just saying that because I walked in. And then I walked in, and Pastor Paul looked at me and said, hey, bud, we've been praying you'd come back. And I thought, okay, well, I'm here. And then Charlie looked at me and said, hey, can you speak on Wednesday? And I said, okay. <laughs> yes, anyways, that was the Holy Spirit working in me to get me back over here. But I uh, just wanted to say, guys, look, we need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit in you. It changes you. He guides you. He leads you. Amen. Just because, and just because you don't speak in tongues, it doesn't mean you don't have the Holy Spirit. I want you to get that deep down in your spirit. Amen? Uh, if you have any questions about it, read 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. It really talks about it. And if you, if you still don't understand it, there's some men and women in this church, the campus pastors, the elders, get with them. They are well-versed in speaking in tongues. And I appreciate them so much for being studied up, for being prayed up, for people like me that have questions. When I come and ask them, they're ready. Amen? So, and I also believe the Holy Spirit is the forgotten man in the Trinity, but I also believe that the Holy Spirit is our comforter. Because that's what Jesus said. Wait for the comforter. And he comforts you when you don't understand what's going on, when you don't know which way to turn, when you don't know who's for you, when you don't know who's against you. The Holy Spirit's there saying, I'm always going to be here. He's there giving you love. He's there giving you peace and passion. Amen. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that healings come. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, and I still believe in healing. Anybody believe in healing? Anybody still believe in miracles? Because we believe that in this church. We believe that the Holy Spirit didn't stop with the 12 disciples. Remember, there was 120 in the upper room that got filled with the Holy Spirit more than this to 12 disciples. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in being filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that miracles can happen. But I believe it's going to be with God's purpose. Amen? When the healing gifts, when healings come, when the gift of healing comes, I don't get the gift of healing if I'm praying for somebody to be healed. Who gets the gift of healing? It's the person that needs to be healed. I'm just a vessel. I'm just a, just a person that God will use to pray with somebody. And I always believe that I shouldn't have to, to, to let the Holy Spirit move. I don't have to be there. Just let the Holy Spirit move. I have people praying all the time for healing for my wife. I prayed for y'all. For some of y'all have been healed from some things. And you know that. Amen. But I believe we've got to have the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will lead you when you're in a bad place. He'll lead you and he'll guide you. I just want you to really get that. In, and that was totally off script on my sermon. But spend some time with the Holy Spirit. If you've got questions about the Holy Spirit, get in the Word of God. Do a word search. I'm telling you, you'll be amazed at what you learn about the Holy Spirit. Amen? Anyways, but so often we get, the, get this idea that, that God is only at church. How many of y'all was raised that way? That you had to go to church to find God. That you had to go to church to, to hear the Lord. And, and I don't believe that. You know, and the only time that we can hear from him is if we're inside these four walls. This is just the building. The church is the people. Amen. So if we look, if we look at God and the Holy Spirit, we'll give you an analogy. If we look at God and the Holy Spirit, like they're what? Like there are cell phones. Amen. You leave this thing at home and get half one. To work, what are you doing? You're going back to pick it up. You let this thing break, what are you doing? You're going to buy, buy a brand new one, no matter what the cost is. Amen. We should have let the Lord be the same way. We should never leave home without God. We should never leave home without the Holy Spirit. And if you feel like you've left home without taking God with you, you need to bust a Yui and go back and pick him up. You don't want to live or go through the day without the Holy Spirit in you. Amen. So church, I say this in love, but let's stop pretending that we're all searching for God. He's right there in the midst. He's right there with us. He's right there around us. He's right there for us to grab a hold to. Let's stop pretending that we're trying to find the Holy Spirit. Because believe me, if you're really searching for something, you're going to find it. He's there. He's waiting for you. He's never left you. You've left him. Amen. And once I got a grasp of that, I understood and got the scales off of my eyes. I understood my relationship with God totally changed. Amen. So let's get to, the, to today's message. Today's message is titled, God is Sovereign. I had to look that word up because I thought I knew what sovereign means. How many of you know what sovereign means? Not a lot of hands raised up. Mine wouldn't have raised up either until I looked at it. That's one of those words that we hear every now and then. That we all say hey, amen when the pastor says it. And we all look at each other and give each other a thumbs up and have no idea what it is. Right? It's kind of like, you have no idea what it is. But we all nod our heads when it's spoken. Like, yeah, I understand it. I get it. What exactly does sovereign mean? Sovereign means that it means supreme ruler. God is sovereign. God is a supreme ruler. It means possessing ultimate power. Amen. Um, sovereign has everything to do with power. It, it describes a person who has supreme power or authority, like a king or a queen. It means that they have power over themselves. If you have supreme power, you have power over yourselves, you have power over your government, you have power over everything that is around you. All things are under the control of a supreme ruler. Um, God is the sovereign Lord of all by an incontestable right of the creator. No, nobody can contest God being sovereign because we weren't there when he created things, amen? Um, real quick, some of the synonyms for sovereign. Who, know what's, who's, who knows what a synonym is? I used to, yeah, it's not a cinnamon roll. It's a synonym. It means the same thing, amen? All right, a synonym. A synonym is a word that means the same thing. For example, synonym for car would be something like automobile. Okay, um, synonym for awesome would be your pastor, right? Okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. No. Yeah. I need, Emily told me to quit telling jokes, by the way. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, here are some synonyms for sovereign. It means chief. Chief. Uh, dominant, first, greatest, the highest, master. I will primary, supreme, amen, because God is sovereign, I will joyfully submit to him. I don't want to submit my life or my will to somebody who might think they're a God. I don't want to submit myself to somebody or my will to somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about, amen. I'm going to submit to God because he is sovereign. He is all-powerful. He is almighty. He is from the beginning and the end. He is everlasting. 
God. Amen. Daniel 4, 35 says, all the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. Amen. He has the power to do as he pleases among the angels of heaven and those who live on earth. No one can stop him or challenge him saying, what do you mean by doing these things? No one can call up God and say, hey, I want to challenge you on your sovereignty. You just can't do it. God is sovereign. He controls times and seasons. Daniel 2, 21 says that, and he changes the times and the seasons. When has God ever changed the time in the Bible? Have you ever seen, have you read those, those parts? Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to uh, Joshua chapter 10. I'm going to read these real quick. Joshua chapter 10, verse 12 through 14. And, and I want to read these because I want you to see how sovereign our God is, how much power he has, how much authority he has, not just over us, our will, and our emotions, but the times and the seasons and everything. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Joshua chapter 10, verse 12 through 14. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and the moon in the valley of Agilon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped till, people, till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jeshur? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day? And there, and there has been no day like that, before it or after it, that the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Amen. And the second uh, point I want to make is in 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20. Um, he did the same thing for King Hezekiah, but it was a little different. 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Follow along with me. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what is the sign that the Lord will heal me? And that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day. Then Isaiah said, this is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing which he has spoken. In other words, whatever you ask, he's going to do. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees, or shall it go backwards 10 degrees? And Hezekiah answered, it is an easy thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. No, but let the shadow go backwards 10 degrees. So Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backwards, by which... It has gone down on the sundial of Ahaz. Only a sovereign God can reverse time. Only a sovereign God can make the sun stand still and the moon hold its place without causing catastrophic events. Amen. Only a sovereign God can dirt, turn back time. I know some of you got in your mind, Cher can do it. She can't. Only God can turn back time. And it wasn't just a matter of turning time. Amen. Back time. But the earth had to reverse its direction. It had to reverse its course. And not just the earth, but everything involved with the earth. The galaxies, the moon, the sun, everything had to go backwards. All life went back. Everything had to go in reverse. Only a sovereign God can do that. Amen? Only a sovereign God can do that. And just, just for a record, the changes that God made with the time for Joshua, he corrected with Hezekiah. Everything is in order. God puts everything in order. He's not, he, had to, he had to make the correction right. Or we wouldn't be right here where we're at today. God is sovereign, amen. By his outstretched hand, he delivered the people from Egypt. Exodus chapter 12, verse 29 through 32. Follow along with me if you're there. Real quick. Exodus 29. Okay. Exodus 12, 29 through 32. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captives who were in the dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. The only ones that there was not a house where there was one dead was the children of Israel. Amen. God is sovereign. Only God can do that by his outstretched hand. Uh, don't mess with God. I wrote that down on one of my notes. Don't mess with God. Don't antagonize God. Don't get him ready to fulfill his wrath upon your head. Amen. Don't mess with him. He's not a God to play with. He doesn't play when it comes to his people, and he doesn't play when it comes to salvation. He's serious about it. He's so serious about it, he sent his son to die for it because he wants you. He needs you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to have a, a born-again life as a believer. Amen. 
Amen. So, so don't mess with God. He's a sovereign God, but he's also a patient God. And I'm going to talk real quick about some plagues that he sent on Egypt to show, not that he was a, 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 a vengeful God, but he was a patient God. How many times did he give the Egyptians time to get it right? How many times was he patient enough to say, look, I'm going to send this one, and y'all get it right. I'm going to send this one, and you get it right. Amen? Um, so he sent ten plagues to Egypt in the hopes that they would listen to Egypt. And I want to give you some deep knowledge about these plagues. God didn't just willy-nilly send these plagues on Egypt. He had a plan, and he had a purpose. Only a sovereign God has a plan, and he has a purpose. Because these ten plagues that he sent were actually the gods that the Egyptians served. Imagine that. The very people that they served, the very things that they served, God sent to antagonize them. God sent to cause uh, trouble in their lives because they weren't listening. Amen. They worshiped the Nile River. God turned it into blood. They worshiped the goddess of the fertility, which was a frog. I think if I was going to pick a goddess to be a fertility goddess, it definitely wouldn't look like a frog. Amen. Um, Yes, it was a frog. God, so God sent frogs. They were in their houses. They were in their bathrooms. They were in their clothes. Frogs like you could not imagine. Um, we serve a sovereign God. Sometimes he'll allow frogs into your life to get you to a place where you'll cry out to him. Because they did cry out, and then they went back on their word. They worshiped the earth God. He was the God of the dust. So God came in and said, okay. He smote the dust and turned it to lice. Have you ever had lice? Of course, you're not going to raise your hand. <laughs> Didn't expect you to. I had lice growing up all the time. And for that very reason, our heads stayed shaved. And the only reason my sisters and, and, and female cousins didn't get their heads shaved is because they were girls. But they were cut short. Lice isn't something fun. And it's disgusting to talk about. But I realized that it wasn't just because I grew up thinking only poor people get lice, right? No. We had it a long time ago. And I'm not saying I'm rich, but I'm way better off than I was living in that trailer park that I grew up in with no electricity, and we still ended up getting it. You can't help it. It was everywhere. You got to wash your clothes. You got to wash your socks, all the bedding. It's a nightmare. So just think about the Egyptians having as much as the dust of the ground. They all had lice. I know that's kind of uncomfortable to talk about because now everybody's itching their heads. (laughs) Look at y'all. You just mentioned lice and you start itching everywhere, right? Amen. He's a sovereign God. So our sovereign God turned the dust into lice. They worshiped the God who they said was over all creation and the sun movement and the rebirth. So God sent flies to swarm them. They worshiped the goddess of love and protection. So God sent a plague to destroy all their cattle and their livestock. And sometimes when you're not doing what God wants you to do, he'll get in your pocketbook. Sometimes when you're not where God wants you to be, he'll allow things to happen that'll bring you down to a place where you're willing to listen to him. So he got into the pocketbook. Could you imagine how much cattle and livestock Egypt owned to be destroyed? Could you imagine the smell three days afterwards? It's gross. But God will get into your pocketbook. That was their wealth back then. They were, by the way, they worshiped the God of the storms and, and, and disorder. So God sent locusts from the sky. They worshiped the sun God. So for three days, there was complete darkness, total, utter darkness. So imagine, uh, amazing that number three representing darkness because in the belly of the deep, Jesus was for three days. When, he was in, in, when Jonah was in the well, he was in there for three days. I'm not saying there's some secret Bible code with numbers, but numbers do play a significant role in, the, in why and how God does what he does. Amen. Um, they worship Pharaoh. They worship Pharaoh, who they believed had ultimate power, and because of that, God sent a spirit to kill all firstborn in Egypt. See, they worship people. A lot of times we worship people. A lot of times we will set up people, and I hope y'all ever never do that with me. But other people, other pastors that are more prominent and more further along in their ministry, will look at them like, "Oh my God, they're so powerful. They're so they're so righteous. God is doing so amazing things in their life." And we get and we start worshiping them, and then when they make a mistake and they fall, we lose our, our trust in God because we had our our hope and worship in worshiping in another man. Well, these people literally worship Pharaoh. They had to worship Pharaoh not only because. He would kill them if they did, but they didn't know any better. They had a God for everything. They had a God for every area of their life. And I couldn't imagine living in those times where I had to spend all my days, had to worship to this God, have to sacrifice to this God, had to do this to that God. I'm so thankful for Jesus. I only got one God to worship. 
Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. This is where, um, and so he sent the, the Spirit to kill all the firstborn. He sent the Spirit to kill all the firstborn. This is where the Passover comes in. They went and told all the, the Israelites, look, you take some hyssop and some blood, put it on the mantles of the door, and put it over the top, and this is a symbol that we are covered under the blood. Amen? It goes forward, talking about Jesus. But you're covered under the blood, and so they did. And if they didn't, they lost their firstborn. And we look at, and when we, a lot of times when we read the Bible, we think the firstborn is the infants. Some of the firstborn that was, was dead and killed were grown men. It wasn't just babies, the firstborn of all. So there was a, a lot of, God brought them to their knees. What God was showing the Egyptians is your God, Pharaoh, cannot control what I do because I'm God of all. That was the whole purpose in all these plagues, is to bring Egypt to their knees, amen? And that's where we get the Passover, slaughter a lamb without spot or blemish. Even today, God gives us specific instructions for our exodus out of this world. He gives us specific instructions for our exodus out of the world. And I don't know exactly, I don't believe this is exactly what Bible stands for, but I had a kid tell me one time that Bible stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. It may not be real, but it sounds good. Amen. So are you reading your instruction manual that God has given you? Unlike most men, we buy something, first thing we throw out is the instruction book. Look, get the instruction book. Read it. Read this book. This book will change you. Nothing I'm saying is going to change you. It's only God's word that will change you. And if you're not spending time in it, you're not going to change. Amen? God is sovereign. He will allow things to come into your life to get you to a place where you will submit to him. How many of y'all have had some rough times in your life lately? Amen? How many of you cry out to God more when you're in a bad place than when you're in a good place? Because I always felt like when I'm in a good place, I don't need God. I always feel like when I'm on top of the world and everything's going the way I want it to go and I got a pocket full of money and I got everything I need in life, why do I need to call out to God to help me when I've already helped myself? Even in those times, even in those times when you're up, God wants you to have a relationship with him. Even in those times when you feel like you've got everything you could ever imagine, God is saying, I'm right here with you. I want to enjoy some of the goodness too. Don't just call on me when things are bad. But he's a good, patient God. You can call on him when things are just bad. But he wants to have a deep relationship with you. Amen. But he'll allow things to come into your life. You know, he'll allow things to happen so you can get your money right. He'll allow things to happen so you can get your heart right. Because look, God's a loving God. But I want you to understand that at the end of the day, he's concerned about your eternal destination. That's what he's concerned about. Yeah, it's nice to be blessed. Yeah, it's nice to have money coming out of my ears. Yeah, it's nice to have all the new things that everybody's got, the nice clothes, everything we could possibly imagine. But in the grand scheme of things, that don't matter when it comes to your salvation. That's what God's concerned about. And he's not just concerned about us here in Alvin, Texas, but God of the, United, of, of the world. He is sovereign. And he will allow things into your life. And even as Christians... That's, a, that, that's where we get mixed up sometimes, guys. We think that once we get saved, that God doesn't really allow bad things in our life to get us to where we want to be. But if you're, again, if you're sitting there doing nothing and God's calling you to do something, he's going to send something to get you out of your nothing so that you can do something for him. Amen? So find your something. Find your something before you get your nothing. Amen? I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> God is sovereign. He's going to allow things to come into your life. Only a sovereign God can send plagues like these. Can you send flies to, to attack my home? Can you send frogs to my house to interrog interrogate my children? Can you do that? Can you send locusts to eat up all, all the crops? No, you can't. You can't. Can you drop fireballs from heaven? Innumerable fireballs from heaven? No, only a sovereign God can do that. Some of y'all have spit out some fireballs from your mouth that you need to retract and get back because once the words leave your mouth, you can't get them back. Stop spitting fireballs. You're not a Mario brother. God is sovereign. He controls nature for his purposes. I would have thought more of y'all would have laughed at the Super Mario joke. I mean, what does this world come to? Fortnite? Come on, guys. Y'all remember? Does anybody remember Super Mario and the fireballs? 
Okay, those fireballs y'all are shooting out of your mouth, you need to get them back. Amen? Okay, okay, point made. God is sovereign. He controls nature for his purpose. Amen? In Job chapter 37, he says, God speaks to the snow and allows it to fall. God speaks to the rain, and it comes down gently. He speaks again to the rain, and it comes down heavy. He calls the whirlwind from the south and, and the cold from the north. By the breath of God, he says, ice is given. Can you control the winds? Can you control the rate at the, of the speed that snow falls to the ground, church? Can you make the rain fall softly or make it pour down like thunder? In Mark chapter 4, Jesus speaks to the storm, and he says, stop. Jesus speaks to the storm, and he says, stop. We often question miracles, don't we? We often say, you know, I believe in miracles, but we haven't seen miracles. And I want to say it's different. I, I believe in miracles because I believe when you wake up in the morning, a miracle just happened. And it's only because of his grace and his mercy that he has allowed this world to continue living in the sinful state that we're living in. And if he doesn't come quickly and rain down his judgment upon us, then he, God, needs to go and apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for what he did to them. We're a wretched generation. Everything that we can do evil, we're doing evil. And we don't even think about it. We don't even have no repercussion for the things that we do or the things that we look at. All we say is, you know what, I'll do it again tomorrow. I'll get right tomorrow. Well, tomorrow never comes. We're living in a time and age where, look, we ain't got time to play around no more. There's no more time left. Quit saying, I'll do it tomorrow. Quit saying, I'll get right tomorrow. You don't have a promise of tomorrow. Quit living in the sinful life that we're living. We, we got a church, a house full of people here that I know are, are Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-filled, tongue-speaking men and women of God. Amen? But we live in a generation that don't. We live in a world... We live in a world that don't want Jesus. They don't want nothing to do with Jesus. And if you come and talk about Jesus, they're going to laugh at you. And that they're going to ridicule you. And even God is sovereign. In men's group, we talked about God loving the unlovable. In, in, in men's group this morning, we are talking about God loving the people that we knew that we didn't want to love. We got to get out there, church. We got to get out there. We got to be that light. We got to be the, the, the people that God is calling us to be. And only God can, can, only God can calm and stop the storm. But I'm telling you, if I'm in a place and I need to look up at this hurricane or this storm and say, in the name of Jesus, you need to stop, I can do that because of the power and the authority that goes through me of Christ Jesus. We've all been endued with the power on high. We don't know how to access it, most of us. We don't know how to use it. That doesn't mean we go around casting out demons here or setting up a shop to cast out demons here. No, God gave us the ability to trample on serpents and to trample on demons. So as you're walking in your ministry and you're getting closer to him and something gets in your way, you can rebuke it in the name of Jesus, not to set up a ministry. There ain't no deliverance ministry. Just letting you know, it doesn't exist. We all have the, the ministry of deliverance if we have in the field with the Holy Spirit. Amen? How many of y'all have cast out your, your mother-in-laws? <laughs> huh? How many of you have you cast out those, your, your kids' friends that come across them? Friends that aren't no good, that you know that ain't no good, and you tell them, in Jesus' name, boy, you get out of here. God, have mercy on the man that shows up to take my daughter out. I have to be a little lenient. Because when I showed up to my wife for our first date to meet her parents, I had a rebel flag sleeveless shirt and a cowboy hat on, tattoos blazing everywhere. And why her mom and dad let me go on a date with her, I'll never understand. That had to be Holy Spirit. That had to be the Holy Spirit working miracles. Because I promise you, I wasn't living the way I needed to be living. Amen? Anyways, totally off subject. Um, God is sovereign. He chose us to be like Christ. And I'm going to close with this this morning. God chose us to be like Christ. How many of you work at being like Christ? How many of you really work at being more like Jesus? I notice a lot of times we work like being all these people that work out. You know, it's great to work out. I wish I had time to work out. I love to work out because it makes me feel good. I don't do it because it makes me look good because obviously I don't look good. But I like the way it makes me feel because it releases endorphins, amen? But we strive to be like so many people. 
We strive to be like the girl that's wearing the pretty clothes. We strive to be like the guy that's got the six-pack. But how many times do we strive to be like Jesus Christ? Is any of that going to matter when he comes back? I'm not saying not to work out. I'm not saying not to look at other people for examples. But look, Romans 8, 28 through 30 says, And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these also justified. And whom he justified, these also, he also glorified. God wants us to be like Jesus. When you want to be like somebody, what does that mean? What does it mean to be like Jesus? That means you do the things that Jesus did. Well, what did Jesus do? What are some of the things that Jesus did? He went around. He loved on people that nobody else would love on. He touched the people that were sick. He healed people. Do you have the power to heal? Absolutely. If it's, if it's in God's purpose and if it's in God's plans that you lay your hands on somebody and they get healed, the Holy Spirit will allow it to happen. Every, you know, look, there's, everything has a plan and a purpose. Okay, there was nothing morally wrong with Jesus turning those stones into bread when Satan tempted him. The problem when it came is when he performed a miracle outside of God's will. Can you perform miracles? Yes, you can. If, you, if you're going to be like Jesus, you're going to perform miracles. Signs and wonders will follow those that believe. And he says, even greater things than these shall you do. Jesus loved the unlovable. How many people do you love that's unlovable? How many of you got people in your family right now that you can't even stand to look at? How many of you? I mean, we're having church. Can we be real? How many of you got people in the church? Can you love God? Can you love like God loved? Can you be like Jesus? When you be like Jesus, that means you got to love people that Jesus loved. You don't love because you want to love. You love because Christ wants you to love. Jesus was patient. He was slow to anger. Can you be like Christ? At the end of the day, that's what we need to work towards. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for who you are. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in truth. Did you catch that, church? From the beginning, God chose you. You weren't a mistake. You weren't an accident. You weren't a late night decision. You were predestined. Before the foundations of the earth, God knew you and he loved you. And it's always been about you. From the moment he created heaven and earth and set man on this earth, it was about the people. He loves you so much. He wants a relationship with you. It's nice and fun to talk about him, but do you really know him? It's nice and, and neat to talk about things that you know the Bible says, but do you know him? You don't have to be this radical, crazy, you know, out of sorts person to have a relationship with God. It's simple. He wants you to talk with him every single day. He wants you to say, you know, Jesus, I kind of messed up this time. No, I'm really struggling with this. I need help here, Father. I'm having a hard time forgiving these people. They really hurt me. They really hurt my family. They really hurt my children. I'm having a hard time going to work, Lord, when everybody keeps getting promoted above me. And here I am doing what's right in your eyes. He wants to hear your voice. He says, my sheep know me. The people know me because they know my voice. Do you know his voice this morning? We know what his word says. I know everybody in here. I know you study, I know you read, and I know you pray, but have you stopped to listen to God, to see what he would have you do, to see what he's speaking into your heart, into your mind? He wants to have a deep relationship with you. He wants you to talk to him when you're down. He wants you to talk to him when you're up. 
He wants to talk to you. You know, if you're not praying for the, guy, for the person you're dating and asking God, is this the one? A lot of times we fail to do that. But then when things don't go right, we want to go and ask God, well, what happened? Well, he didn't ask permission. He didn't ask permission. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to have a deep friendship with you. Some of y'all got friends that y'all text 24-7, nonstop. You're always texting, you're always talking, but is your relationship with Christ like that? You always texting God? You always talking to Him? He wants to be your best friend. How many of you can, in here, can, without, with absolute certainty, you can raise your hand and say that you know you're saved? That you know without a doubt that you are born again, that if you die today, you're going to step into an eternity with Christ. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus told the guy, the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. How many of you can absolutely with surety say that? How many of you could say, I'm not sure? How many of you would raise your hand this morning and say, I am not sure if I have a relationship with Christ. I've heard about him. I think I'm praying to him sometimes, but I just don't know. Just raise your hand this morning if you're not sure, if you're unsure, if you even have questions, if you even have doubts about your salvation. Just raise your hand. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. And we don't ever like to close any service without giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be your Savior. So whether you raised your hand, which some of you have, or if you haven't, I'm going to ask you all this morning to pray with me. Can we pray together? Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I need your forgiveness. I believe you died in my place and rose the third day from the grave so I can live in your presence forever. Jesus, come into my life. Take control of my life. Forgive my sins and save me. Thank you for eternal life. In Jesus' name. Can we all stand to be dismissed this morning?